On April 28, 1988, Aloha Airlines Flight 243 took off on a routine flight from the big island of Hawaii to Honolulu. However, over the next 30 minutes, the flight would devolve into a nightmare for the passengers and crew and become one of the most significant events in aviation history. The plane, a Boeing 737, had accumulated almost 35,000 flight hours since it was built in 1969. Due to its use in short flights between the various islands, it had accumulated over 90,000 takeoffs and landings, almost twice its designed workload. The flight departed from Hilo International Airport at 1.25 p.m. local time, with six crew members and 89 passengers on board. The plane had conducted three round-trip flights already that morning, with no incident. Weather was fine, with no weather advisories reported for the route. The flight to Honolulu is so short that the flight crew serves drinks while the plane ascends to its cruising altitude of 24,000 feet. 7,300 meters. The passengers, however, remained fastened to their seatbelts. The flight crew consisted of Captain Robert Schronsteimer and First Officer Madeline Mimi Tompkins. Both were experienced with over 16,000 flight hours between them. On this flight, First Officer Tompkins was the pilot. At around 1.48, the flight crew heard a loud bang, then were immediately buffeted by hurricane force winds. The cockpit door had broken away and the captain could see, quote, blue sky where the first class ceiling had been. What they didn't know was that a large section of the roof, measuring over 18 feet, 5 meters, had been torn off the plane's fuselage. In the passenger cabin, things were not much better. Of the four flight attendants, one was knocked unconscious, and when the others looked around, they could not find their lead attendant, Clarabel C.B. Lansing a veteran of 37 years. She was nowhere to be found. One of the flight attendants tried to contact the cockpit, but got no answer. Not knowing whether the pilots were dead or not, one of the flight attendants began asking passengers the one question you never want to hear on a flight. Can you fly a plane? Captain Schronsteimer took control of the plane and performed an emergency descent. At their current altitude, the passengers would suffer from hypoxia or oxygen deprivation and lose consciousness otherwise. The crew declared an emergency and diverted to the nearest destination, Kahului Airport, on the island of Maui. During the approach, not only did the left engine fail, but the crew could not be certain that the front landing gear was down. After lowering the landing gear, the light confirming that the nose gear was down did not light up. Standard operating procedure dictates that if the flight crew is not certain that the nose landing gear is deployed, the plane should circle the airport until its deployment is visually confirmed from the ground. However, the condition of the plane gave the captain no option. He was going to land the plane and take his chances. After 13 terrifying minutes, the plane landed at Kahului. Emergency evacuation slides were activated and the passengers quickly evacuated the airport. 65 people were reported injured, eight of them with serious injuries. The plane was written off and dismantled on site. Additional damage to the airplane included damaged and dented horizontal stabilizers, both of which had been struck by debris. The leading edges of both wings and the engine cowlings had also sustained damage. Numerous passengers suffered injuries from flying debris, wind burns, and other side effects from the extreme conditions on board the plane. There weren't enough ambulances on the island to transport all the injured to hospital. Some had to be transported in private vehicles. It was only after landing that the crew confirmed what they had suspected. Head flight attendant C.B. Lansing was missing. She had been standing in the area where the roof opened up. In fact, several passengers saw her fly up and to the left before disappearing from view. A blood stain on the outside of the plane near the breach was a testament to her violent end. Coast Guard searched the ocean for three days, but found no sign of either the veteran flight attendant or any plane debris. The National Transportation Safety Board immediately dispatched a team of investigators to Hawaii. They expected this would not be an open and shut case, as the fuselage that had broken off was missing. 
What they did find was that the plane's fuselage was ridden with corrosion, fatigue cracks, and repair patches. It was a wonder the plane had lasted this long. Nearly every rivet hole had a fatigue crack emanating from it. The fuselage of the Boeing 737 is built using overlapping aluminum frames that were thinner than previous aircraft. Boeing themselves acknowledged that reducing the thickness could make the fuselage more susceptible to metal fatigue. The junction of the overlapping sheets, called a lap joint, were bonded by cold epoxy, and they were joined to the airplane's frame by three rows of rivets. However, the presence of condensation or the exposure to high temperature prior to its application meant that early Boeing 737s had incomplete bonds at random locations in these joints. Water could then enter these incomplete joints and cause corrosion and metal fatigue. An airplane's fuselage is not static. Each time the cabin is pressurized, it is placed under stress, which is then removed at the end of the flight. The constant back and forth movement caused the metal to slowly break down over time. The plane's 90,000 takeoff and landings would have accelerated this process immensely. In 1987, one year prior to the incident, the Federal Aviation Administration issued a mandatory airworthiness directive requiring operators to implement the extra inspections that Boeing had recommended in an earlier directive. Aloha conducted visual inspections of the fuselage, but mechanics often did it at night under artificial light. Due to this, most fatigue cracks went undetected. The National Transportation Safety Board conducted a thorough examination of a small piece of the fuselage that had embedded into the leading edge of the right wing during the accident. They found at least five fatigue cracks that should have been easily detected. The investigators believed the abundance of fatigue cracks allowed the failure to bypass a safety feature called tear straps. These straps were attached to the fuselage skin at 10 inch intervals, forming a grid that would redirect a breach and prevent it from spreading to adjacent areas of the fuselage. However, these straps were designed to limit damage caused by debris impacts, rather than slow moving fatigue. Furthermore, corrosion had caused some of these straps to detach from the skin. The NTSB surmised that once Flight 243 reached its cruising altitude, the external pressure caused several large cracks to join together until they all failed simultaneously, ripping off a huge section of the fuselage, tear straps or no tear straps. There were alternative theories for the disaster. Several years later, an engineer named Matt Austin proposed a somewhat more gruesome explanation. He explained that the tear straps could have worked as intended, but flight attendant CB Lansing could have been sucked into the resulting hole. The blockage could have caused what is known as a fluid hammer, a spike in pressure which overloaded a large section of the surrounding weakened fuselage, causing a catastrophic failure. The NTSB conceded that yes, this was plausible, but maintained the evidence of the original investigation was stronger. Ultimately, they could not say with certainty how and where the failure began, except it must have been above the window line and near row 3, where the floor had buckled upwards the most. The NTSB concluded in its final report that, quote, the probable cause of this accident was the failure of the airline maintenance program to detect the presence of significant disbonding and fatigue damage, which ultimately led to failure of the lap joint and the separation of the fuselage upper lobe. Contributing was the failure of the airline management to supervise properly its maintenance force and the failure of the FAA to enforce Boeing's Alert Service Bulletin. In 1995, a memorial garden honoring the unfortunate CB Lansing was constructed near Terminal 1 of Honolulu's International Airport. <laughs>